Episode 3, The Lizard. After a strange and perilous journey, Jonathan Harker has arrived at Castle Dracula and made the acquaintance of the Count. Subtle fears have risen, and he begins to doubt his safety and his sanity. Something so strange about this place, and all in it, that I cannot but feel uneasy. I wish I was safe out of it, or that I had never come. If there were anyone to talk to, I could bear it, but there is no one. I have only the Count to speak with. I fear that I am myself the only living soul within the place. I had only slept a few hours when I went to bed, and, feeling that I could not sleep any more, got up. I had hung my shaving glass by the window and was just beginning to shave. Suddenly, I felt a hand on my shoulder. Good morning. Oh, Count. Oh, you startled me. You will forgive me. I was amazed that I had not seen him, since the reflection of the glass covered the whole room behind me. I looked again in the mirror, and this time there could be no error. I could see the Count over my shoulder, but there was no reflection of him in the mirror. In starting, I had cut myself slightly, and it had bled a little, so the blood was trickling over my chin. I laid down the razor, turning as I did so half round to look for some sticking plaster. When the Count saw my face, his eyes blazed with a sort of demoniac fury, and he suddenly made a grab at my throat. I turned away, and his hand touched the string of beads which held the crucifix. It made an instant change in him, for the fury passed so quickly I could but hardly believe it was ever there. Take care. Take care how you cut yourself. It is more dangerous than you think in this country. Then, seizing the shaving glass, he went on. And this, this is the wretched thing that has done the mischief. It is a foul bauble of man's vanity. Away with it. And opening the heavy window with one wrench of his terrible hand, he flung out the glass which was shattered into a thousand pieces on the stones of the courtyard far below. Then he withdrew, without a word. When I went into the dining room, breakfast was prepared. I could not find the Count anywhere, so I breakfasted alone. Afterwards, I did a little exploring in the castle and found a room looking towards the south. The view was magnificent, and from where I stood there was every opportunity of seeing it. The castle is on the very edge of a terrible precipice. A stone falling from the window would fall a thousand feet without touching anything. As far as the eye can reach is a sea of green treetops, with occasionally a deep rift where there is a chasm. Here and there are silver threads where the rivers wind in deep gorges through the forests. But I am not in heart to describe beauty, for when I had seen the view I explored further, Doors, doors, doors everywhere, and all locked and bolted. In no place, save from the windows in the castle walls, is there an available exit. The castle is a veritable prison, and I am a prisoner. The conviction of my helplessness overpowered all other feelings. I sat down quietly as quietly as I have ever done anything in my life, and began to think over what was best to be done. Of one thing only am I certain, that it is no use making my ideas known to the Count. He knows well that I am imprisoned, and as he has done it himself, and has doubtless his own motives for it, he would only deceive me if I trusted him fully with the facts. So far as I can see, my only plan will be to keep my knowledge and my fears to myself, and my eyes open. I had hardly come to this conclusion when I heard the great door below shut and knew that the Count had returned. I went quietly to my room and saw the Count making the bed. 
This gave me a fright, for if there is no one else in the castle, it must have been the Count himself who was the driver of the coach that brought me here. And if this is so, how is it that he could control the wolves by only holding up his hand in silence? And the people of the village? What meant the giving of the crucifix, of the garlic, of the wild rose? Bless that good, good woman who hung the crucifix round my neck. It gives me comfort and strength. I must find out all I can about Count Dracula, as it may help me to understand. Tonight he may talk of himself, if I turn the conversation that way. I must be very careful, however, not to awake his suspicion. It is after midnight. I have had a long talk with the Count. I asked him a few questions on Transylvania history, and he warmed up to the subject wonderfully. In his speaking of things and people, and especially of battles, he spoke as if he had been present at them all. He spoke like a king, and grew excited as he spoke, and walked about the room, pulling his white moustache and grasping on anything which he laid his hands as though he would crush it by main strength. Ours were victories which the likes of the Habsburgs and the Romanovs can never reach. The warlike days are over. Blood is too precious a thing in these days of dishonorable peace. And the glories of the great races are as a tale that is told. It is close upon morning. And this morning brings a storm. Mm, such weather can bring a peaceful sleep. Yes, to sleep in peace. Sir? It is nothing. You stir an ancient memory. Tell me, young Harker, have you written since your first letter to our friend? Mr. Peter Hawkins, or to any other? Uh, no, I, I have not. Then write now, my young friend. Write to our friend and to any other, and say, if it will please you, that you shall stay with me until a month from now. Do you wish me to stay so long? I will take no refusal. When your master engaged that someone should come on his behalf, it was understood that my needs only were to be consulted. I have not stinted. Is it not so? While Count Dracula was speaking, there was that in his eyes and in his bearing which made me remember that I was a prisoner and that if I wished it, I could have no choice. The Count saw his victory in my bow, and his mastery in the trouble of my face, for he began at once to use them, but in his own smooth, resistless way. I pray you, my good young friend, that you will not discourse of things other than business in your letters. It will doubtless please your friends to know that you are well and that you look forward to getting home to them. He gave me a quiet smile with the sharp canine teeth lying over the red underlip. I understood well that I should be careful what I wrote, for he would be able to read it. I trust you will forgive me. But I have much work to do in private this evening. You will, I hope, find all things as you wish. Why, yes, of course. I bid you good evening, Mr. Harker. With this he smiled, turned, and went quickly from the room. After a little while, not hearing any sound, I came out of my room and went up the stone stair to where I could look out towards the south. Looking out on this, I felt that I was indeed in prison, and I seemed to want a breath of fresh air, though it were of the night. 
Now and then, the clouds gave way, and during these moments, I looked out over the beautiful expanse, bathed in a soft yellow moonlight. As I leaned from the window, my eye was caught by something moving a story below me, and somewhat to my left, where I imagined, from the order of the rooms, that the windows of the Count's own room would look out. I drew back behind the stonework and looked carefully out. What I saw was the Count's head coming out from the window. I did not see the face, but I knew the man by the neck and the movement of his back and arms. I was at first interested and somewhat amused, for it is wonderful how small a matter will interest and amuse a man when he is a prisoner. But my very feelings changed to repulsion and terror when I saw the whole man slowly emerge from the window and begin to crawl down the castle wall over the dreadful abyss, face down, with his cloak spreading out around him like great wings. At first I thought it was some trick of the moonlight, some weird effect of shadow, but I kept looking and it could be no delusion. I saw the fingers and toes grasp the corners of the stones worn clear of the mortar by stress of the years, and by thus using every projection and inequality moved downwards with considerable speed just as a lizard moves along a wall. What manner of man is this? Or what manner of creature is it in the semblance of a man? I feel the dread of this horrible place overpowering me. I am in fear, in awful fear, and there is no escape for me. I am encompassed about with terrors that I dare not think of. I watched in amazement as the Count moved in this reptilian fashion. Then he vanished into some hole or window. When his head had disappeared, I leaned out to try and see more, but without avail. I knew he had left the castle now, and determined to use the opportunity to explore more than I had dared to as yet. Taking a lamp, I tried all the doors. They were all locked, as I expected. At last, I found one door at the top of the stairway, which, though it seemed to be locked, gave a little under pressure. I exerted myself, and with many efforts forced it back so that I could enter. This was evidently the portion of the castle occupied by the ladies in bygone days, for the furniture had more air of comfort than any I had seen. I found a soft quietude come over me. Sitting at a little oak table where, in days past, some fair lady sat to pen with much thought and many blushes, a letter to her princely lover. God preserve my sanity, for to this I am reduced. Safety and the assurance of safety are things of the past. Whilst I live on here, there is but one thing to hope for, that I may not go mad, if indeed I be not mad already. If I be sane, then surely it is maddening to think of all the foul things that lurk in this hateful place that count is the least dreadful to me, that to him alone I can look for safety, even though this be only whilst I serve his purpose. While seated at the desk, I remembered a mysterious warning the Count had given me. It had frightened me at the time. Let me advise you, my dear young friend. Nay, let me warn you with all seriousness that should you leave these rooms, you will not by any chance go to sleep in any other part of the castle. It is old and has many memories, and there are bad dreams for those who sleep unwisely. Be warned, should sleep now or ever overcome you or be like to do, then haste your own chamber, or to these rooms, for your rest will then be safe. 
Even so, I took a strange pleasure in disobeying these words. The sense of sleep was upon me, and with it the obstinacy which sleep brings as outrider. The soft moonlight soothed, and the wide expanse without gave a sense of freedom which refreshed me. I suppose I must have fallen asleep. I hope so. But I fear for all that followed was startlingly real, so real that now, sitting here in the broad, full sunlight of the morning, I cannot in the least believe that it was all sleep. I was not alone. In the moonlight opposite me were two young women, ladies by their dress and manner. I, I thought at the time that I must be dreaming when I saw them, for though the moonlight was behind them, they threw no shadow on the floor. They came close to me, and looked at me for some time, and then whispered together. One was dark, and had a high, aquiline nose like the Count, and great, dark, piercing eyes that seemed to be almost red when contrasted with the pale yellow moon. The other was fair, as fair as can be, with great wavy masses of golden hair and eyes like pale sapphires. Both had brilliant white teeth that shone like pearls against the ruby of their voluptuous lips. I was repelled, and yet I felt in my heart a wicked, burning desire that they would kiss me. They whispered together, and then they laughed, such a silvery, musical laugh, but as hard as though the sound never could have come through the softness of human lips. The fair girl shook her head coquettishly, and the other urged her on. Go on. You are first, and I shall follow. Yours is the right to begin. He is young and, and strong, and tonight he is ours. I lay quiet, looking out under my eyelashes in an agony of delightful anticipation. The fair girl advanced and bent over me till I could feel the movement of her breath upon me. Sweet it was, in one sense, honey-sweet, and sent the same tingling through the nerves as her voice, but with a bitter underlying the sweet, a bitter offensiveness, as one smells in blood. I was afraid to raise my eyelids, but looked out and saw perfectly under the lashes. The girl went on her knees, and bent over me, simply gloating. There was a deliberate voluptuousness which was both thrilling and repulsive, and as she arched her neck, she actually licked her lips like an animal till I could see in the moonlight the moisture shining on the scarlet lips and on the red tongue as it lapped the white, sharp teeth. Lower. And lower went her head as the lips went below the range of my mouth and chin and seemed about to fasten on my throat. Then she paused, and I could hear the churning sound of her tongue as it licked her teeth and lips and could feel the hot breath on my neck. Then the skin of my throat began to tingle as one's flesh does when the hand that is to tickle it approaches nearer. I could feel the soft, shivering touch of the lips on the super-sensitive skin of my throat, and the hard dents of two sharp teeth just touching and pausing there. I closed my eyes in a languorous ecstasy and waited, waited with a beating heart. But at that instant I was conscious of the presence of the Count and of his being as if lapped in a storm of fury. As my eyes opened involuntarily, I saw his strong hand grasp the slender neck of the fair woman and pull her back. Her blue eyes transformed with fury, the white teeth champing with rage and the fair cheeks blazing with passion. But the Count, never did I imagine such wrath and fury, even to the demons of the pit. His eyes were positively blazing. The red light in him was lurid as if the flames of hell fire blazed behind him. His face was deathly pale, and 
the lines of it were hard like drawn wires. The thick eyebrows that met over the nose now seemed like a heaving bar of white hot metal. With a fierce sweep of his arm, he hurled the woman from him and then motioned to the other as though he were beating her back. In a voice which, though low and almost in a whisper, seemed to cut through the air and then ring round the room, he said, How dare you touch him? How dare you? There is no love for us. I too can love. You yourselves can tell it from the past. Well, now I promise you that when I am done with him, you shall kiss him at your will. Tell us when soon. Now go. I must awaken him, for there is work to be done. Are we to have nothing tonight? And she pointed to the bag which he had thrown upon the floor, and which moved as though there was some living thing within it. For answer, he nodded his head. One of the women jumped forward and opened it. If my ears did not deceive me, there was a gasp and a low wail of a half-smothered child. The women closed round, whilst I was aghast with horror, but... As I looked, they disappeared, and with them the dreadful bag. There was no door near them, and they could not have passed me without my noticing. They simply seemed to fade into the rays of the moonlight and pass out through the window, for I could see outside the dim, shadowy forms for a moment before they entirely faded away. Then the horror overcame me, and I sank down. Unconscious.